morning folks Moses Woodson here from High Desert Homestead I'm up in here behind this trailer because the wind is really blowing and I'm not going to be able to film a whole lot you're not going to be able to hear me um, I'm going to be working Prince Jack this morning uh, it's really cold this morning if the wind would quit blowing it wouldn't be so bad but not ideal situation to be training uh, a horse or donkey a mule anything uh, it'd be a good day to be sitting drinking coffee but I'm gonna get him out I'm gonna work him this morning uh, I'm just gonna try and take and get him to go forward I worked him a little bit uh, after Alan dropped him off and uh, he, he's he's willing he's, he's really willing and, and he's really gentle uh, sorry about the wind um, but I'm gonna just take and try to get him to go forward on cue uh, when I ask him to go forward I'm gonna be incorporating some words uh, into the uh, cue to go forward um, that's gonna come in handy later when we actually are working him pulling stuff first thing I want to talk about is one of the biggest misconceptions in equine training and that is philosophies. If you own a horse, a donkey, a mule, no matter what level you compete at, no matter if you're just a backyard horse owner or you've been a professional trainer. Everybody has a philosophy whether they know it or not. And everybody's philosophy is going to be different because not everybody's going in the same direction. For instance, my horses, I want my horses to do what I want, when I want, the way I want. And I have to have those expectations of them because the situations that I'm going to be placing them and me in are dangerous. If I'm roping a bull or chasing a wild cow or trying to catch a, a wild horse, I have to rely upon that animal. And it would be an injustice for the horse and me if I didn't take the proper steps to train that horse the way he needed to be in order to do the job that I'm asking him to do. So there's so many people out there that think because they don't have to do something or they don't understand why somebody's doing something that they're doing it wrong. The fact of the matter is is that the backyard horse owner that maybe goes on a small trail ride twice a month it's not going to have the expectation of somebody who's out here chasing cows a barrel racer who runs their horse at every barrel race in the country is going to do things different than me it doesn't make what they're doing wrong it's just they have a different philosophy my horses when I need them, I need them. I don't have time for discussion. I don't have time for, for a horse to argue with me. And it's the level of training that I'm talking about. When I need my horse to sidestep, I need him to sidestep. When I need him to back up, I need him to back up. It could be the difference between life and limb. So... When I take and I work with an animal like Prince Jack here, who's going to be 
pulling a, a wagon or a cart, the person who gets in that wagon or cart is going to be putting their lives in his hands. I have to know that he knows what I'm asking him and he understands what it is that his job is. So everything I do with an animal has a particular purpose. I'm not just doing it because, well, it looks good or, or that it's what somebody said, well, this works. I've got a particular mission in mind and the end result is what I'm working towards. I see so many people work with horses and they'll do two or three good, really good things and then they do something that is detrimental to what they said their purpose was, no matter what it is. So we have to do everything in conjunction so that it helps everything else you do. If you don't, then you're working against yourself. With that being said, you have to have realistic expectations. Not every animal is going to perform at the level that you may need in order to do what it is you're doing. You take Prince Jack here, for instance. He's he's pretty good. He's he's aptable. You can introduce a new concept to him, and he understands it. And that's the process. If you're evaluating a horse, you introduce a concept, and once they understand it, how willing are they to do it? All these things are indicators as to whether you can progress in the training or how fast you can progress in the training. Every day, I review the concepts I've introduced to him and see how quick he comes back to where he was the day before. Like forward motion on cue. He knows it. Sometimes he, he takes and doesn't want to do it. And that's understandable. In the very first days of training, you're going to have two steps forward and one step back. But you keep reintroducing the concept. And then if they say, oh yeah, I understand that concept. Then you take and you add a little something else to it. You add another concept. And then if he gets that, then you add another concept. Then you take and you give him a day off. And you come back. How well does he go right back to working? How well does he understand the concepts? That's my measuring tape as to how well the animal is remembering and getting the whole process. As we progress in the animal's training, you're going to find that they fall into some kind of category. Uh, there's a whole lot of folks out there with different ideas about whether a horse, a donkey, a, a, a mule is an introvert, an extrovert, whether they're expressive, they're not expressive. But I think the one that is probably the best scale to look at is what I call balls and blocks. If you look at a wide spectrum and you've got a hundred degrees of difference between uh, one end to the other, uh, if you think about a ball, if you kick it, if you bounce it, it's going to continue to move. If you kick a ball, it, it's going to bounce around. If you kick a block, you might move it, you might not. Um, and this is the two ends of the spectrum that I look at. Donkeys generally fall into the block end of the spectrum. 
you take a, a horse like Cowboy, uh, my daughter's horse, he is, he's an extreme ball. He's sitting on ready <laughs> and he's willing to go. Um, he's fired up nine tenths of the time. So it doesn't take very much pressure to get him motivated. It doesn't take very much pressure to initiate movement from him. He will go if you just, if you just barely ask. Riding him uh, for some people is a challenge because they're not quiet enough so it makes him nervous. Where Prince Jack here, he's more on the block end of the spectrum. Um, it's a little bit harder to get him motivated. It's a little bit harder to keep him motivated. It's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just the way it is. So I'm not going to change what I do. I'm just going to change how I apply what I do. So my program is going to stay the same, but my application is going to change to fit his needs. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit about what I'm doing here with Prince Jack. I've got him to go forward. Uh, I moved a little bit more to, to behind him as I was driving him. Just kind of testing the water, seeing what uh, I can do with him, see what he likes and what he don't like and right here I run into the first uh, little issue if you will it's not anything that's not expected he doesn't like ropes uh, tangled around his back feet and being a young donkey he doesn't have a healthy release of pressure so he tries to push into me uh, most animals when they're born are introverted horses, mules, donkeys, oxen uh, that I've trained, they all push into pressure. And that's what he tries to do. When he views the rope being tangled around his back feet as pressure, he wants to run into my hand and, and run into me and get away from it. Uh, that being said, there's positive pressure and negative pressure. And teaching the animal through this process of what is pressure and what's not pressure is really important. You have to expose them to positive pressure, which from me means I want you to move your feet in a particular way. Negative pressure is anything other than what I initiate that causes the animal to move his feet or change position. So he's he doesn't like this rope being thrown around his feet and he views that as pressure so in the balancing act right now of him learning the rope being wrapped around his feet wins out over me saying no you can't move uh, the other thing this does is it gives him a healthy uh, release of pressure so when he's feeling pressured by this rope i'm teaching him to back up this process is really repetitive. Uh, I'll just keep wrapping that rope around his back legs and keep asking him to back up. He has to learn that there is a healthy release for when he feels pressured, when he feels negative pressure, uh, he can back up. It's the most unnatural gait for, for any animal, particularly donkeys and oxen have a harder time with it than, than horses and mules, but he's doing really well. I cut out a lot of this video because it's just repetitive. I have a, a three and done rule. If he'll give me three really good uh, attempts or if he'll give me uh, three things that I'm asking for, I'll go and do something else. Um, particularly with a block type animal uh, if you drill them a whole lot they will shut down on you and as long as he's wanting to move forward tells me he's not ready to shut down uh, as long as he's wanting to move his feet so I just keep throwing the rope around his back legs 
and when he moves, I back him up. Now, he gets pretty insistent a few times. He really pushes on me. He's really pushing on my hand. And I don't want to just muscle him, but I want him to learn that uh, this rope being tangled around his feet is not pressure. And then I want him to learn the healthy release, which is back up. It is a long process that takes a lot of patience. Prince Jack's going to be a draft animal and he's going to have trace chains, tugs, uh, different pieces of harness, maybe even the reins that could get tangled around his back feet. So he's got to learn that anything around his back end uh, getting tangled around his feet is not going to hurt him and this is just part of the foundation uh, before we take him progress further so that when I get him in those situations and something does happen, say he steps over a trace chain or he steps over a tug uh, and it starts rubbing the inside of his leg, he doesn't become excited and it exasperates uh, his fears and can be something that mentally and emotionally could uh, damage him, not to, not to mention uh, if he got really excited, he could physically hurt himself. So this is all part of preparation for things that are coming later. This is just a really good desensitizing technique to prepare your animal if they were ever tangled in a fence, tangled in a rope. Um, I've seen a lot of horses that are tied up. Um, people leave the ropes too long, they get tangled in it and the horse just starts fighting and they're usually tied to a trailer or tied to a tree or a hitching rail and it can be a disaster trying to help them because they're thrashing around and you can't really get to the lead rope or the tie rope to get them loose. So teaching an animal that things tangled around them, getting them in different positions to where um, they need your help in a controlled environment uh, is just a really, really good thing for the animal. In this first uh, video here, I want to talk just a little bit about judicial use of pressure. Um, there's both ends of the, of the spectrum out there. You got people who don't use enough pressure and you've got people who sadly use too much pressure. You really have to be able to uh, read the animal uh, and see what they need at the, any particular given time and that takes experience. Um, it goes back to expectation. Um, when I'm working an animal uh, I know what they are capable of usually after working them a few times you have to be in tune when an animal is being resistive or they're just not getting the concept. Um, if they understand the concept but they're, they're being uh, resistive to it, then you have to use um, pressure judiciously. In other words, you have to use the least amount of pressure necessary to get the desired result. If you're going to do justice to an animal, uh, you have to know how to apply pressure, when to apply pressure, or you'll end up nagging an animal and not really teaching the animal anything. And there again, you have to take into account what type of animal you have, whether they're a ball or whether they're a block. Every animal's different, and you just got to take and stand on that balance beam and do the best you can for the animal at any given time. I want to thank you all for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed this first session. The next few sessions probably won't be as long, uh, but I hope they're educational and entertaining.
That being said, I'm going to end it up. Remember, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season ye shall reap, if you faint not. We'll see you later. <laughs>